the home of a gallant outlaw band. They contained everything that a romantic boy could love or long for. Or, as Mark Twain himself said, I seemed to tire of most everything I did, but I never tired of exploring the cave. The cave burned itself into Sam's memory and imagination. He would later recall the cave in five of his books, most notably in The Adventures of Tom Sawyer. In the book, he describes the cave in vivid and captivating detail. By and by, somebody shouted, Who's ready for the cave? Everybody was. Bundles of candles were produced, and straight away there was a general scamper up the hill. The mouth of the cave was up the hillside. Within was a small chamber chilly as an ice house, and walled by nature with solid limestone that was dewy with a cold sweat. The procession went filing down the main avenue, the flickering rank of lights dimly revealing the lofty walls of rock. Every few steps, other lofty and still narrower crevices branched from it on either side. For McDougal's cave was but a vast labyrinth of crooked aisles that ran into each other and out again and led nowhere. No man knew the cave. That was an impossible thing. Most of the young men knew a portion of it. And it was not customary to venture beyond the known portion. Tom Sawyer knew as much of the cave as anyone. The Adventures of Tom Sawyer was published in 1876, and soon people were coming from all over the country to see the cave and other places in town described in the book. The number of people visiting the cave steadily increased, until at last a man named John East established the first official guiding service in 1886 making Mark Twain Cave the first show cave in Missouri. It has been open to the public ever since. The tours were given by Lantern until 1939, when electricity was first installed. In 1972, Mark Twain Cave was declared a U.S. natural landmark by the National Park Service. The national landmark has a system of 260 passageways, totaling about three and a half miles. Looking at a map of the cave system, you can see by its maze-like pattern how easy it would be for early explorers to become lost. And many did, at one time or another. On your tour today, you will walk approximately five-eighths of a mile, following the red line on the map. The route is easy to walk, there are no steps or steep inclines, and most people can make it easily. However, if you have any illness or claustrophobia and feel you will not be able to make the tour, please turn in your tickets now for a refund as refunds cannot be made once you are inside the cave. Mark Twain Cave is home to geological, historical, and cultural treasures of national significance. Please help us to preserve and protect our national and natural heritage. Please do not write or scratch on our walls, throw away all food and drink before entering the cave, and refrain from smoking while you are inside. Thank you for visiting us today, and now it is time to meet your tour guide. Now, first, first bad review. Don't. Why'd you get a bad review? Well, I accidentally called out George Maggots on that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my bad on that one. All right. So, welcome to the Mark Twain Cave. It's a cave. It's 52 degrees year-round, winter, summer, it does not matter. It's also a dry cave, which means there is water in this cave, but there will never be any form of flooding. Now, talking about water, if you go to the very top of the cave for me, you guys see that large crack up there? That is our lifeline of the cave. That's where water poured in from this cave years ago. The rock that surrounds us, what we call Louisiana limestone, it is extremely rare. It can only be found from Handle, Missouri, and 30 miles down south to Louisiana, Missouri. Now looking at the limestone still, you guys see a little crystal thing right up here or back there, just depending on where you're standing. These are what we call calcite nodules. Early explorers thought they were diamonds, but when they mined them, they found them to be soft. I mean, most hard to scale like diamond is a 10. These are a three. And for reference, your fingernail is a 2.5. They're also worth just as much, so they didn't swing and miss for those explorers. <laughs> now, Talking about the explorer's sill, looking at the lower level of the cave, you'll notice this black tent. This black tent is simply this torch set. 
His spores are gathered towards it. He put it up against the cave wall, and he leaves soot all over it. Last thing I want to run over is what we're walking on. It's called Gray Glacial Clay. It is 100% natural to the cave. It's just been packed down from people walking on it for over 200 years. And I just threw away a bunch of information at you guys. Do you have any basic questions about the cave? We're all good? All right. I'm going to call it in, and then we're going to go to Sport Cave. Yep. One day he's heading to St. Louis and he discovers that his 14 year old daughter had died of pneumonia. Now he wants to preserve her beauty, so what he does, he brings her dead body into the cave, throws her in a copper tube, fills it up with the alcohol solution, then hoists her up and puts on copper pipes and puts her all the way back there. And then boards up the entrance of the cave, puts a no entry sign up front, and leaves town. When he left town, local Hannibal High Schoolers saw that no entry sign and they could really care less. They ripped down the board of the cave, explored the cave, and discovered the body. When they discovered the body, instead of telling the townspeople about it, what they did was far worse. They brought the little sisters, little cousins, and little uh, <laughs> brothers into the cave and told them horror stories the entire time. And here's where it gets really bad. They would have a high schooler planted behind the dead girl's body with a tube opened up. There would be strings tied to the girl's wrist, neck, and hair. And when the kids got right up on the body, the high schooler would yank down on the strings, and the girl's dead body would flail up, and the kids would go out of the cave screaming bloody murder. <laughs> so word got out very quickly for obvious reasons, and there was a petition signed to have the body removed from the cave. But before that petition went through, Joseph McDowell heard his daughter was being treated as a sideshow. He didn't like that, and he had her removed from the cave himself, and he brought her to a mortician. That mortician had estimated his daughter had been dead for two to three weeks. She had actually been dead for over three years, oh making her the first successful documentation of a preservation of a body in any first world country. Wow. Now with that, do we have any questions? We're all good? Mm -hmm. You guys can follow me this way. <clears throat> you guys see that Steve Dunker signature right up there? Right to the left, all the way up there. Well, Steve Dunker, he has a name signed up to stay over 250 times. We don't think he was crazy or pretty sure he was mapping out the cave. 206 passages, 250 signatures. I heard he was kind of tuckered out. <laughs> Tucker. Oh, I know. I know. Well, there's one right there. There's Tucker. <laughs> you had to have climbed up there to do that. What, what year is that one? 77? Right here we got a dining game. A dining game is another landmark in the cave. It looks like a fish playing off in the opposite direction of where we're walking. Passing through our wishing well here, it has been 100% up to you to donate if you would like. You can donate pennies, quarters, dollars, debit card with a pin number on it. <laughs> <laughs> Where that money goes to, it goes to the Tom and Becky program. The Tom and Becky program, we have two local seventh graders represent Hannibal and Tom and Becky. In their senior year of high school, you write an essay, then become eligible for multiple college scholarships, and that's where that money goes to. We do have to collect it around five times a year because if we leave it down in too long, the clay will actually begin to destroy or degrade the money. Mm How -hmm. we get it's pretty simple. We find our smallest tour guide. <laughs> we hand them a bucket, and then we say fetch. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness.
see, 1868. There's Tucker. That ought to be a game. How many Tuckers can you find? So Tom and Becky successfully got away from the bats, but now they're over here. Becky's just yelling at Tom because she didn't want to be in the game in the first place. Now they're lost in the dark. Tom goes, hey, even though we are lost, I'm going to find a way out of here. Takes a kite string out of his pocket, does one into his finger, the other into a rock. Tells Becky to pull that string if she ever gets nervous. But what Tom does, he crawls all the way down there. While crawling down there, he discovers a drop-off and doesn't know if that drop-off is 3 feet or 30 feet. For obvious reasons, he's not going to risk it, but off in the distance, he sees a light. He assumes that light is coming from a search crew, so he starts yelling and hollering, hoping to get their attention, and he does, but the light actually reveals to be the face of Engine Joe. So if you're not familiar, Engine Joe is the antagonist in the adventure to Tom Sawyer. Tom Sawyer witnessed Engine Joe killing a man in a graveyard. He then later testified against him in court. Engine Joe swore he was going to get back at Tom, and then he proceeded to jump out of his second story window of a courthouse to escape from the police. So Tom's seeing Indian Joe, he's not too thrilled about that. He freaks out. He runs all the way back here. He grabs a hold of Becky and he goes, you know what? Pats aren't that bad, and they head off in that direction. Engine Joe, he hears the commotion, but Louisiana limestone here is a soft rock that absorbs almost all sound and vibration. And around the corner, sounds come out very muffled and hard to hear. So Engine Joe does hear Tom, but he doesn't recognize Tom's voice and high up with paranoia, he assumes that's the police. He freaks out. He grabs the torch, he throws it down, he stomps it out, and it goes further off in that direction, which is where we're actually going to be heading now. You guys can follow me. You feel alright? Yeah. You feel any spirits? No? Live down here. Feels so freaking good. Yeah. 1920. Oh my lord. The signatures are everywhere. Come on, hun. Tourists had to climb down a rope ladder, but you know, when lawyers became more of a thing, we had to get rid of that. So, we dug out glacial clay from the sides, put these pipes into the ground for stability. You also call these pipes our salad pipes. <laughs> <laughs> it's in the script, I have to say it. Um, <laughs> but in full seriousness, though, I do recommend holding on to them at least just a little bit or rubbing your hand over it because this game down here can be slick. It's not necessarily wet, there's very dull spots that you find yourself tripping up on. You guys can follow me? Oh, it's dark. And right there is another thing. I'll go after you, love. Wee! 
What makes this landmark kind of unique is when you look at the top of it, you'll notice it's very shiny. The reason it's very shiny is because people keep touching it. The reason people keep touching it is that there's a, well, an old tail. If you back to back the alligator, you give your tour guide a good look, and he can quickly and safely get you out of the cave. <laughs> now, before you go to rush to touch it, I get it. I'm not offended. I understand. Science man, why it's shiny might gross you guys out. It's pretty simple for the most part. Us people, we have oil on our skin. Every time we touch something, we leave just a little bit of that oil there. And from people patting the back of this thing now for over 200 years, it has basically become a human oil buildup. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Also, this is gonna sound weird, but it's happened twice now. Please do not lick the rock. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to go into it, but first of all, it does not taste like ice cream. Now you guys can just follow me this way. Don't lick it, honey. Do I have to tell you twice? Oh my lord, look at that. That goes way back in there. Oh, we gotta keep up with the one. So welcome to Autograph Alley. We call this place Autograph Alley because there are over 2,000 signatures in this passage of the cave alone. In the entire cave, there are over 250,000 signatures. Oh my We've had no new signatures since 1972 because in 1972 it became a national landmark and now if you were to sign or take anything from the cave, that would be a $1,000 fine, a felony on your record, and to top it off, a sweet, sweet year in jail. Mm. So not really recommended, but you do you. <laughs> now once we're done going through Autograph Alley, on your right you'll see our post office. Our post office is simply just another landmark in the cave. Post office. So right up here we got a drawing of Mark Twain. He was drawn by a St. Louis cartoonist in 1933. He used only pork soot and a knife to make it. Sixty nine. <laughs> right there.
Oh, look at these just really thin passageways. Look at that passageway. Right on up here, uh, we got what we call our mouse bridge. It is man made. And we put it there because supposedly one time a mouse jumped on a tourist mid tour and they put that there hoping that mice would happily crawl across that. <laughs> I've never seen that thing used in my entire life. So, oh, okay. some moss up there you can see back behind it. Yeah, it's formed by the heat of the light. Oh, yeah. We do have a killer for it, and that's like one of the main reasons why we turn the lights off. There's another passageway. Push out of here. Make sure you don't come towards me once passing the fence. Oh wow. It's okay to use a flash? Yeah. Right here though, this is where we kind of do warm stuff and we do end up walking down there. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. So you'll see all that. Excellent. Okay. So welcome to Grand Avenue. Because Grand Avenue is the longest passageway in this cave. It is 1,100 feet from end to end, 22 feet from the floor to the ceiling. And right now we're at the deepest point in the cave. We are over 250 feet below surface level. We haven't actually gone downhill. The surface above us has risen. So right now we're at the top point of the hill. Now looking at the ceiling of the cave for me though, you guys see those brown spots up there? Yep. Mm -hmm. Any guesses on what those are from? Lantern used to hang here, I'm guessing. Mm -hmm. I don't know. From bats. Bats. So these spots right here show that at one point during this cave there were over a million bats in it. They're formed what we call a bat chandelier. Bat chandeliers just when they hang off of each other. Now it's not the technical name for that, but there's no real actual technical name for bats hanging off of each other. <laughs> now the brown comes off to oil off the bat skin. It's not their gone If it was one drip, I now would quit. The spots up there, the carbon dioxide the bats breathe off. And right here, these spots are so large that they would indicate that the bat chandelier would go from the ceiling all the way to the floor. Wow. Now, if you notice, we don't have over a million bats in this cave right now. By the early 2000s, we only had a couple thousand in there. Then in 2015, a thing called white nose syndrome hit. It's a white fungus that would grow in a bat's nose. It only affects bats, but it has them wake up early during hibernation. You then use all their fat reserves and die. Mm -hmm. So we went from having thousands of bats in this cave to 11 to 13. Mm. Now for this next part of the tour, it does get dark. Are we good with that? Mm -hmm. Yep. Right. We have any device that produces light, make sure that it's off for me. We're gonna have any light during this part of the tour. I don't just cover it up again, make sure it's actually off. Uh, class is my back clock. I'm sorry, I'm getting around Alright, so we are nearing the end of our tour, which means we are nearing the end of our story. Tom Becky he successfully got out of the cave, but Tom fell ill for three days. After he recovered from his illness, though, he wanted to go back into the cave. But the mayor, also Becky Thatcher's dad, was like, no, you can't go in there, nor is anyone ever going in there again. He actually had the entrance to the cave boarded up. But Tom let the mayor know the engine Joe was inside, and the mayor immediately switched up on his no one going in the cave policy. So we got a search team together, came down to our discovery entrance right over there, ripped down the border of the entrance to go find Engine Joe, and he found Engine Joe within like five seconds. Dead. Engine Joe was trying to carve his way out, but he became malnourished and starved to death. <laughs> now luckily that is all fake, but the characters are based off of real people, even Engine Joe. Engine Joe is based off a guy who by the nickname of Indian Joe. Indian Joe's real name was Joe Douglas. Uh, Joe Douglas confronted Mark Twain at a boat convention. Mark, one of the nicest guys you've ever met, 
Why would you make me the villain in your book? And Mark Twain replied, simple. You are a saint. But you are the most hideous person I have ever seen. <laughs> That's literally it. That's all. <laughs> now, Joe Douglas was not born lucky. He was born half Native American, half African American, and when born into his Native American tribe, instead of realizing that someone cheated, they assumed him to be cursed and had the scalp. And then at the age of three, he got smallpox and left little divots and scars all over his face. And when he grew up, kids would look at him and he'd go scream and run for their lives. One of those kids grew up to be Mark Twain, and Mark Twain made Indian Joe into Engine Joe. So Joe Douglas did not think that was a good enough reason for him to be the villain in his book, and he swore revenge against Mark Twain. Mark Twain jokingly said, okay, if you want your revenge, you're going to have to outlive me. He meant that as a joke, because you got to think, Joe Douglas was already a full-grown man by the time Mark Twain was a kid. But life has a funny way of working, because Joe Douglas actually did outlive Mark Twain. Wow. Mark Twain lived to be 74 years old. He died under Haley's Comet, which is kind of cooler, as he predicted, which is kind of cooler. It's a creepy thing, as I look at it. And Joe Douglas, he lived to be 102 years old. Oh, God. <laughs> but he did not die from natural causes. He actually died from food poisoning. Oh. As Squirrel's Bats was his favorite snack, pickled pig's feet. Oh. Oh. I made a good bat, right? <laughs> Now, we are passing by our discovery entrance. On our second right from our discovery entrance, we will be going down a slick passage. For the most part, right now it's pretty dry, but there is a lot of uh, loose gravel that you can find yourself tripping up on, so just be careful. And you guys can follow me. Comes with a neat story. I love this. This is a better than. See? Much more interesting than Walter Mark Twain. I haven't seen a bunch of them. Right? <laughs> Did you see me stop once I realized? Yeah. I'm like, what, 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 what? I mean, it's so much fun. I love this. See? With all the signatures and stuff. No. You do know. I do know. Engine Joe. Oh. Cano. Oh, come on, camera. Engine Joe's Cano. Here, Joe, come here. We gotta go. Well, Be careful of it, it might be slippery. So live here. No, you what? What? It's so nice and cool. Come on, love. Hi. <laughs> oh, we had so much fun. I'm telling you why. This is the best. We actually raised them to be tour guides. Company and it's written in red berry juice. 
Uh, this signature now is very damaged and faded because we used to have a white light on it and that nearly ran the signature completely. Then we tried to cure it and that backfired, but now that blue light back there uh, kills the bacteria that tries to eat away at the signature. Hmm. And it is doing a pretty good job so far. Oh, I see. Please go everywhere. This is probably one of the neatest caves I've been in. I mean, it's easy to go through. I mean, the one in Silver Dollar City is stuck on hard on you. Yeah. That's intrusion. 
<laughs> my hip. Uh-oh, we're lost. John East, he's the first tour guide this game's ever had. He's also the worst tour guide this game's ever had. <laughs> this tour is range from five minutes to five hours. If it was a good fishing day, we'll be in and out as quick as possible. So you charge everyone one dime, walk through this cave for two to three minutes, and then you'll bear as loud as you possibly could. People go out of the cave screaming and running for their lives. And not only did they get lied to, they got played because during that time, there was not one bear anywhere in this region. <laughs> Nowadays, they're actually starting to migrate, so that's exciting. But uh, if it was a bad fishing day, he walked people through this cave for up to five hours. And it was not out of the kindness of his heart. He would just always get lost and find the same rock with a different story every single time. <laughs> now, we are getting left up here. We're going to be going under Headache Rock. And if you're over six feet tall, please watch your head. And if you don't watch your head, just please watch your mouth. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try. <laughs> Hit my head for sure. Please Just watch. Don't. Just no, watch. Don't. It'll be a bump on top you've of a bump. It. You've already done that once. Oh, you got the light. Oh shit. Oh. Turn with your phone. Oh, that's the entrance that goes out. Right. I gotta go. Come on, love. Okay. Headache rock. Just please watch your head. Ah. Punk. <laughs> oh yeah. So right up here, passing by our Devil Slide. Devil Slide is a ten foot slide that heads under a little past headache rock. He gets the name Devil Slide because long ago kids would uh, get buckets of water, he'd pour it down there, and then they'd go down the slide for hours. Whoa. But when they get back home, their mom would see their clothes ruined. She'd be furious and she'd beat the devil out of them. <laughs> Therefore, the name Devil Slide. I heard you by her. Now I gotta ask, do we have any romantics in here? Okay, <laughs> times. Well, we've had nine weddings in this cave. Our first one dates back to 1942, but in 1941, Sarah Gray, you saw the name Anna Gray, going through Mary's corner. You see the name Anna Gray on the left behind you, right up here. Right she did some research, found out that was a great great grandpa, and in honor of his name, she got married under his name. Oh, that's cool. Our latest wedding was in November of 2020, and the coolest story we have for our weddings in 2003, the two tour guides found love and got married in the cave. No. That's nice. I'm going to do a vacation. Hmm. In the cave. Marriage corner. Couldn't have a very big wedding. Oh my god. We are passing through Mother's Hubbard's cupboards up here. It's just like the poem, they are bare. They used to be used for food storage during the winter long ago. The idea is that food would stay cool, but it would not freeze over. I mean, I was talking about, I heard the noise. I forgot, I got 